about some science. Um, so today we are very happy to welcome Dr. Angela Collier. Um, Dr. Collier is a dynamicist who works across multiple length scales, ranging from planetary systems to star clusters and uh, all the way up to the entire galaxy. Uh, some of her research interests include multi-scale secular dynamics, uh, stellar bar formation, uh, buckling instabilities, and the dynamical evolution of dark matter. Uh, Dr. Collier is currently an NSF Astronomy and Astrophysics Postdoctoral Fellow at JILA, uh, formerly known as the Joint Institute for Laboratory Astrophysics in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, and today she will be telling us about the halo bar coupling and how dark matter defines galaxies. So um, take it away, Angela. Thank you. Uh, so feel free to stop me at any point if something interesting happens. And I'll get started. Okay, we already talked about what I'm interested in. So what I will talk about today is dark matter and dark matter's intersection with galaxy evolution. So when you think dark matter halo, you might have a picture like this. Deep inside the dark matter halo lives the galaxy that we see, but this dark matter halo is an order of magnitude larger in mass and in radius than the galaxy. It's cold, it's not very interesting dynamically. But I maintain that that's not true because if you have a very active galaxy at your center, it is going to change the morphology and the evolution of the dark matter as well. So what I will talk about today is a lot of galactic dynamics, but I want you to keep in mind that I'm studying halo bar coupling. So everything I look at is in stars because that's what we can see. But what I'm interested in is what the halo is doing underneath. So we will look at how halos can make exotic galaxies, and also what we can learn about dark matter in our own Milky Way to inform searches for dark matter where we can see it. So I look at galaxy evolution in co the context of barred galaxies. So I maintain that stellar bars, which are these bright features here, are the most important things in the universe. <laughs> and I'll make an argument for that today, but their importance has been known for a very long time. So this is the Hubble fork diagram. As soon as Hubble notices that galaxies exist outside our own, he starts cataloging them by their morphologies. You have elliptical galaxies that become less elliptical and there's this bifurcation where you have spirals where the opening angle of the spiral gets bigger and barred spirals. He thought of this as an evolutionary track. So we have that unfortunate early and late type nomenclature. That's probably not the best. Um, I will be talking about late type galaxies, specifically bars. So bars are important because a spiral barred galaxy is the most common type of galaxy in the universe. Locally, 75% of disks have bars, including the Milky Way, which is cartooned here. The Milky Way is a strongly barred galaxy. Uh, they're responsible for galaxy morphologies and that when you look at one, the first thing you see is that bright stellar bar. The stellar bar is a huge gravitational perturbation. So when a star enters it, it gets trapped. So it's gonna be the brightest feature in the galaxy. But they also drive spiral arms. They funnel gas around the galaxy causing star formation. Um, so they represent even to large radii what's responsible for the morphology of the system. And they are also responsible for angular momentum <laughs> transferring galaxies. So they are the cause of galaxy evolution in systems. Do you imagine a spiral galaxy like this? All the stars are in nearly circular orbits and you introduce a bar perturbation. The orbits in the center become very radial. So this is lower angular momentum. So the bar will trap a star, take angular momentum from its orbit and move it around the galaxy. Also, we can't see galaxy evolution in real time, looking at a single image of a galaxy, but these guys are actually rotating. And bars rotate as solid objects because they are these deep gravitational perturbations. So as they rotate, kind of like a stick in water, they'll inspire spiral arms, but they'll also break against the outer disk and slow down. So you can imagine bar evolution as it grows in length and strength by trapping new stars, but as it rotates, its pattern speed will reduce. So over secular time scales, Hubble time, um, bars will work to move angular momentum to larger radii in the galaxy. Over a Hubble time, they'll be moving 
gas around and forming new stars, and the bars get longer, stronger, and slower. Um, you might ask how we get bars. Uh, you can form bars with tidal interactions, but we think the most common way is through the bar instability, which was found in simulations once you have the resolution to have about 4,000 particles in a disk. Uh, oh, I, this is a whole paper, 1976. If you put 4,000 or so stars on nearly circular orbits, it will evolve seemingly stable for some time. And then spontaneously, a bar will form in the central galaxy. And it's an instability, so it's really cool. Once you have two or three stars on these radial bar orbits, it's a runaway growth process with the bar trapping more and more stars. It's actually much harder to make a disk that avoids the bar instability than to make a disk that forms a bar. Bars are incredibly easy to form. Uh, one way to avoid it is to make an unusually hot disk or an unphysically thick disk. Things like that will work. But once you have a bar, they're also very robust and long lived. So this bar will continue to trap stars, grow in length and strength until it kind of saturates the disk. There's no more angular momentum to move around. And then as long as you want to run it in your computer, you'll just have this happy little bar rotating at some pattern speed. So looking at this, there's a new question. Where are these bars? So from observation, observations, we know bars are ubiquitous. From simulations, we know bars are incredibly easy to form. And once they form, um, they're robust. They're long lived, they'll last a couple of time. So how have these disks evolved to avoid the bar instability? And <clears throat> if you remember the prologue of this talk, you can guess how I will try to answer this question. And that's by looking at the dark matter halo. The dark matter halo appears dynamically boring. It's nearly isotropic, um, it's spherical, shouldn't contain a lot of angular momentum because it is this big spherical structure. It's cold, it's not doing a lot, but if you shove a bar in the middle of a halo, the dark matter halo will respond. Dark matter interacts with gravity. The stellar bar is this huge gravitational perturbation. The dark matter is gonna do something. So I'm gonna introduce you to some of my research, which is simulations of isolated galaxies trying to change the initial conditions of the halo to see if that has an impact on galaxy evolution and morphology. Specifically, I'm gonna look at halo angular momentum profile. So you can measure the cosmological spin parameter, which represents the global angular momentum profile of a dark matter halo as lambda and this is an approximation of what the actual equation is, but if you measure the total angular momentum in that halo and then divide by the maximum possible, like if you were to flatten it and completely support it by rotation, you get some range zero to one. And for context, a disk of stars, which is almost completely supported by rotation, that lambda for a disk would be like 0.98. For halos, from cosmological simulations, we see something like this distribution. So this range here is from zero to about 0.1 with an average of 0 0.035. So dark matter halos have angular momentum. Don't imagine them quickly tumbling, like rapidly spinning. They have a tiny amount of angular momentum, like 10% of the angular momentum in the huge mass of the halo. No, 10% of the disk's angular momentum in this huge mass of the halo. So it seems not important, but because Angular momentum redistribution is so important for bars. You have to check this out. So you will see simulations of Milky Way-like disks inside NFW halos, where the only thing I am going to change is lambda, the cosmological spin parameter. And I will incrementally increase the spin. So a lambda equals zero halo is a nearly isotropic non-rotating halo. We've been doing that simulation for like 25 years. And I will incrementally increase the spin to our maximally spun halo, which is point, lambda 0 0.09, which is a tiny amount of angular momentum for the mass that is in a halo to see what happens. <laughs> okay, so I will start with prograde dark matter halos, meaning 
if the disk is going clockwise, the halo is going clockwise, their angular momentum vectors are aligned. Okay, so now we'll start looking at results. This is that simulation, the fiducial simulation that has been run since like 1998. You have 10 million particles. You start with a thin axisymmetric disk inside of a massive responsive non-rotating dark matter halo. This is standard evolution for a barred, disk, a barred galaxy. You start axisymmetric, you form a bar, the bar is strong, it grows in length and strength for the rest of the simulation. You can see by stronger, you might see the bar getting more rectangular. It's also getting longer. You can see barely on this figure, spiral arms moving to larger radii, which is indicative of angular momentum transfer. To quantify this, we can do Fourier analysis. Um, <laughs> measuring the growth of the M equals two mode, which is a bar mode to the M equals zero mode. You could think of it as like the fraction of stars trapped in the bar. You can see this goes to zero to like 45%. Um, and we measure this for the length of the simulation to see how the bar is evolving in the disk. So this is the disk in the non-spinning halo. At t equals zero, this parameter would measure zero because it's an axisymmetric disk. You can see the bar instability happens. You get this runaway growth in bar strength. And you have a strong bar. There's a dip here, which is due to a second instability called the buckling instability. Um, if you imagine at t equals zero, you have a thin axisymmetric disk. Your vertical dispersion velocity will be at some level and your radial dispersion velocity will be at some level. But once you start forming a bar, that radial dispersion velocity goes way up while your vertical dispersion velocity stays the same. Eventually this is unstable. So your bar literally buckles up and down out of the plane to increase vertical dispersion velocity and allow bar growth to continue. Um, this is similar to like the fire hose instability. The resulting disc is thicker and you get this pseudo boxy peanut bulge, which looks like a bar. So if you see a galaxy that looks like this, you would say, aha, this is a barred galaxy. Um, I wrote a paper on this if you're interested. In <laughs> uh, but even at the lowest point after buckling, you can see we still have a strong bar in the simulation and the bar then just has a secular phase of evolution where it's just growing in length and strength and acting like a bar. So this is standard evolution. And now I can show you my suite of simulations where I incrementally increase halo spin in the prograde direction. And for drama, I will add one line at a time. So <laughs> we increase to 0 0.03. Again, think about how small this amount of angular momentum is added to the halo, but you can already see some changes. Increase again, and interesting things start happening. And here is our maximally spun guy. So three things to notice. This is also a very exciting plot. I don't know if you could tell, but I was like, oh, it's so hard to destroy a bar. Not, not, not sure how we could do that. Um, we're gonna do it right now. <laughs> but three things to notice. First, the more angular momentum in the prograde direction in your halo, the sooner the bar instability happens. All these disks are completely identical at t equals zero. The only thing we've changed is halo spin. So adding angular momentum to your halo is already changing the evolution of your system. A second thing to notice is that the maximum bar here is kind of on the same order. You would expect that these disks are the same the biggest bar a disc can make is gonna depend on like initial disc thickness, initial surface density, that kind of thing. So we would expect all of these maximum bars to be the same, but what's most exciting is this long-term evolution, this bifurcation of evolution, which is the same word I used to describe the Hubble fork diagram. <laughs> um, if you're in a non-spinning or a low spinning halo, you have this strong bar at late times. When you increase halo spin, you can see the buckling is more drastic. It weakens the bar significantly and the bar does not recover. You don't see bar growth in this simulation. To confirm this, we can look at angular momentum transfer. Um, this is kind of a serious plot, so let me describe it. This is the disc inside of the non-spinning halo. On the y-axis, you have the radius of the disc, so at any time, you have like radial bins in your disc. The color represents rate of angular momentum transfer or J dot or torque. 
if this was a galactic dynamics class, we could talk about how like, oh, look at these beautiful OLR resonances and here's the ILR resonance and you can see the bar forming right here. What's important here though, is that we see angular momentum moving to large radii at late times. We have a bar here. The job of the bar is to redistribute angular momentum. This is an active bar. If I look at this same plot for the disc inside the spinning halo, we see this. Um, this is the same buckling instability that you see here, but it's, it's kind of saturated. That's because buckling is stronger in this simulation. But what's important is the noise. Like we no longer have an active bar. We don't see these resonances. We don't see angular momentum transfer. This is evidence we've dissolved the bar. But we can also look at contours. So this is the disk inside the spinning halo taken at the same time steps as the fiducial simulation that you saw. It's an identical disk at t equals zero. The bar appears earlier. This is mid buckling. So it's a slice. So part of the bar is above the plane. But what's important here is this long-term evolution. You don't see a bar. You can kind of see like this oval distortion, but we don't see the bar getting stronger. We don't see spiral arms. There's no bar. We have created a simulation that forms a bar and then the buckling instability happens and the bar is dissolved in the disc. It does not regrow. And it also doesn't undergo a second bar instability to reform and create a new bar or anything. Might be easier to see in contours. So these are three discs at the end of the simulation um, with lambda and the halo increasing to the right. Face on, you see strong bars, spiral arms, increasing lambda, you still have a strong bar. Um, you can see though that even in this disc, angular momentum transfer has been limited because the spiral arms are much closer to the central disc. This would not be considered a bar at all. Edge on, um, when you look at a barred galaxy, the major axis, well, it's kind of like a pencil, like the major axis looks like a bar, the minor axis looks like the eraser. So these two galaxies are strongly barred, but here the major and minor axes are almost indistinguishable. So we've done it. We've dissolved the bar. This is an unbarred galaxy. And that's really exciting <laughs> because that means that we are seeing a process happen that's solely due to the dark matter halo. So what we would like to do is take this as evidence that the initial conditions of the halo play a huge role in how the galaxy will evolve and can explain some of these interesting morphologies that we see that don't have explanations quite yet. So I can remind you what that probability density of halo spin, the distribution looked like and say, well, there's some turnover where you're gonna have a bar at late times or you are gonna have a disc at late times. And happily this matches the fraction of observed barred to unbarred galaxies, but I'm definitely not saying this is the answer and we can look at an unbarred galaxy and know anything about its halo yet. But that is the goal of my research program. Um, <clears throat> so that's really exciting, but you might ask why. And the answer is, stellar bar driven dark matter substructure. So this is that plot of bar strength versus time for the disc in the non-spinning halo. If I make that exact same measurement in the dark matter halo, you get this dashed line here. Completely as a response to the stellar bar existing, the dark matter forms a dark bar or a ghost bar or a shadow bar. Um, the stellar bar is this huge gravitational perturbation. Just like it traps stars, it will trap dark matter. If I make this measurement for all of my halos, you can see something we, that, um, that was not true for the disks. And the disks, I said, oh, all these disks are the same at t equals zero, so their bars will be the same. The dark matter bar depends strongly on the angular momentum profile of the halo. And that makes sense. I've introduced prograde rotation. There are more prograde orbits. If you have a bar rotating in some direction and a halo particle rotating in that same direction, you can trap it. The more prograde or orbits you have, the bigger the population available for trapping, the bigger your dark matter bar. 
Um, <clears throat> let's look at that in a diagram. Here's a barred spiral galaxy. I can approximate the bar as an ellipse, and I can approximate a star as an elliptical orbit. Of course, bar orbits are much more complicated than simple ellipses, but it's an approximation. Imagine that you have this bar processing in the clockwise direction. The star is going to be prograde because disks are mostly rotating in the same direction. So it will also be going clockwise. Imagine this star gets some sort of kick of angular momentum and slows its precession and falls behind. In the plane, the stellar bar is going to apply a really strong torque to this orbit. It will increase its precession speed until it's back in the bar. Similarly, if this orbit starts leading the bar, it will receive the same torque. This time it will slow its precession speed until the bar kind of catches up into it. So over time, these stars are just trapped. Very similarly, low inclination near the plane dark matter, which will be on like a rosette orbit, which I'm gonna approximate as an ellipse, will feel identical torques. Dark matter does not care that it's a stellar bar made up of stars. It obeys the laws of gravity, so it will fall into the bar. And the more prograde dark matter you have, the more dark matter gets trapped. So <clears throat> every single stellar bar lives in a dark matter halo with some prograde orbits. Every single stellar bar will have a dark matter bar component. Here are surface density diagrams of my dark bars. Um, with lambda increasing to the right. And you can see as you increase the fraction of prograde orbits, essentially, you are increasing the barriness of your dark matter bar, not only face on, um, but edge on as well, because dark matter halos have vertical structure, unlike disks. Halos have this huge population of nearly low inclination orbits, but not quite planar orbits. So you get these thick, oblate spheroids near your bar. This is stellar bar driven dark matter substructure. So our central galaxy in the Milky Way, we have a strong bar. We should have a dark matter bar component. Um, <clears throat> the next question is, why does a huge dark matter bar kill the stellar bar? Um, let's look at the angular momentum transfer. So you've seen this plot of torque for the disk, here is the halo. So this is the non-rotating halo. As I mentioned earlier, we kind of expect the halo to be uninteresting dynamically. It's huge. If the disk is spitting out angular momentum, the halo can just gain it and it's not gonna do anything. It's gonna act as a sink. Again, if you're interested in dynamics, you can see the resonant angular momentum transfer here, which is very exciting, but you see orange. This halo, it's non-rotating. It's just gaining angular momentum. And in fact, that's what we expect. We expect halos to be sinks. You can just toss the angular momentum in. And no one's ever observed a dark matter halo losing angular momentum. Except for me. <laughs> um, this is really exciting, too. This is an exciting plot to see. You see this halo, the spinning halo, the one with the really strong dark matter bar moving angular momentum. Um, oh, I don't have any evidence for you, but what is actually happening is this dark matter bar is acting like a stellar bar. It's trapping dark matter orbits, taking the angular momentum and moving it to the outer halo, just like a stellar bar does. Um, <clears throat> that's, that's really, really cool. Um, you see dark matter behaving like a stellar bar. And I do want to remind you, this is purely a response to the stellar bar. If you axisymmetrize your disk at this moment, the dark matter bar just disappears. It no longer has that huge gravitational perturbation trapping it into that orbit. It just kind of dissolves very slowly. This is a pure response to a stellar bar. You need that to exist. But that's really, really cool. You see the halo moving angular momentum around. It's not not interesting dynamically. It's very interesting dynamically. Um, why does this kill the bar? It's actually a super simple explanation. Um, I said, oh, these bars are the same. But if you consider bar as stellar bar plus dark matter bar, the bar in the rotating halo has this huge dark matter component. The dark bar is 30% the mass of the stellar bar. 
compared to in the non-rotating halo where the dark bar is 10% the mass of the stellar bar. More importantly, the dark bars are thick boys. Um, so these are edge on what the dark bars look like. I'm gonna map onto that a, an approximation of the pre-buckled stellar bar. So the stellar bar before buckling is trapped in this thin disc. In order to continue growing, it must buckle up and down into the um, above and below the plane. So in the non-rotating halo, this stellar bar buckles up and down into a nice smooth isotropic distribution of dark matter. It can very quickly move up, move back into the plane and fall back into a nice bar shape. This bar buckles up into a dark matter bar, which also starts buckling. It really slows the process down and changes <clears throat> the azimuthal location of these radial orbits in the plane. So before buckling, all these orbits are aligned in the spinning halo. After buckling, you have a hot disk. These radial orbits, they're still radial, they're still ball, bar orbits, but now they're kind of disassociated as a mutually. So all these orbits have the same pattern speed. They're all bar shaped, but they can't fall back into being a bar. And when you do measure unbarred disk galaxies, they are hotter than their barred counterpoints, which is kind of a happy coincidence. Um, but this structure, this could never form a bar. Even if you created this disk and started your simulation, this would never form a bar, it's just too hot. So even though this disk makes a really nice, really interesting, huge dark matter bar feature, it ends up destroying the bar in the simulation. So that's really, really cool. Um, that is explaining our bifurcation evolution. All right, one last bit of simulations retrograde dark matter halos. Um, if you have a prograde dark, uh, pro dark matter halo where your angular momentum vector can be aligned, you can also have a retrograde where your angular momentum vector is anti-aligned. Um, here's just some terminology, P for prograde, R for retrograde. And these numbers will tell you the lambda. Remember, I am not creating a system that is rapidly rotating in the retrograde direction of the disk. It is just a very small amount of angular momentum going in the opposite direction of the disk very smoothly. And just like before, I can do a suite of simulations where the only thing I change is that incremental increase, but this time in the retrograde direction. So here is a plot of bar strength versus time for my retrograde models. The blue is the same fiducial non-rotating model. And you can see the trend where the more prograde spin, the sooner your bar appears, the more retrograde spin, the longer it takes your bar to appear. But um, I'm covering up <laughs> the second half of the diagram because we again saw something we weren't really expecting, which is this. Um, I would have expected that an increase in retrograde orbits would limit angular momentum transfer. Somehow, Retrograde orbits cannot resonate and bars, they're just so nicely orbiting at some nice pattern speed. They, they, ha they, they prefer resonant angular momentum transfer. So what the heck is happening? <laughs> Why do all of these models have really nice strong bars? Um, we can look at dark matter and as we expect, because you have more retrograde rotation, you have more retrograde orbits, retrograde dark matter should not get trapped in the bar. And that's what you see here. The strongest dark matter bar feature is in our non-rotating halo. And then the rest kind of don't even form that retrograde or that parallel dark matter bar component. And for comparison, here's the strongest dark matter bar and the most prograde halo. And here is the most retrograde halo. So it's a huge difference in stellar bar driven dark matter bar substructure density. <laughs> um, so what is happening? So let me tell you about an interesting dynamical journey to go on. Um, this is a good thought experiment. What happens to a retrograde particle? If your bar is going clockwise, your retrograde particle, we're talking low inclination near the plane retrograde dark matter is going in the counterclockwise direction. This position of orbits, it doesn't matter which direction you're going. There's gonna be a torque applied to this orbit because that's how gravity works this dark matter particle can feel gravity. 
it is gonna feel the same torque that a prograde orbit would, but it's gonna have the opposite response. The bar will pull this orbit um, toward itself, but this will slow the precession speed of the retrograde orbit. It's not gonna pull it into the bar because the retrograde orbit's traveling counterclockwise. So what you're gonna see is this orbit slow down and kind of reach this like slowest point and form what we're calling a perpendicular dark matter wake. You're gonna get a pile up of these retrograde orbits perpendicular to the bar in the plane. It's not gonna stop here though. This isn't a perpendicular bar. It's not stopped. So it's gonna eh, pass over this lowest point. It's again gonna be strongly torqued. This time, this torque is gonna to cause this dark matter orbit to speed through the bar and pile up on the other side. So over time, you get this pile up of perpendicular retrograde dark matter orbits, applying torques on the bar and creating an overdensity of dark matter. This is also a form of bar-driven dark matter substructure, but this time it's made up of retrograde orbits. And with a lot of my work, uh, when we were writing this up, my postdoc advisor, Anne-Marie Madigan and I, we found a paper by Lyndon Bell and Kalnaz who had done the exact same thing, but with a um, disk of stars that are going retrograde to the bar. They found the exact same result, which was really a nice confirmation, but just to give credit where it's due, they did this in the 70s. Um, what does this mean for angular momentum? So here we're looking at the J dot maps for our retrograde halos. This is the non-rotating model. This is our fiducial experiment, resonant angular momentum transfer. As you increase retrograde rotation, you see that most of the angular momentum transfer is happening at low radii. Oh, this, this is the radius on the y-axis here. So rather than moving angular momentum to large radii like this system is doing, this bar is preferring to take angular momentum from the disk and move it to the inner dark matter halo. Which leads to another question. <laughs> How is this happening? So we were trying to solve this and looking at this plot, we saw something interesting. The strongest dark matter component is of course due to the dark matter bar in this non-rotating halo, but the next strongest is in the most retrograde halo. Why would the most retrograde halo have a bigger dark matter bar than halos with more prograde orbits? Um, and it's because of something similar to the Kozai lid off mechanism. Essentially, if you have really, really low inclination dark matter, it's like perfectly planar with the bar. It will have a low angular momentum orbit because it's at a low radii. And when it receives this torque, rather than spinning around the galaxy, it's just gonna kind of flip over its plane and reverse its precession direction. Don't imagine the dark matter particle stopping and turning around, but more like the plane of its orbit flipping. And it's gonna become prograde. Some of these newly prograde dark matter particles will just fly off, carrying the angular momentum away from the bar very efficiently, but some of them will just join the bar because now they're prograde and they can. Looking at the fraction of retrograde orbits, you can see the more retrograde orbits you have, the bigger the population available for these orbit flips, the more flips you have, the more angular momentum is moved. Um, and so what I can do is split this plot into prograde orbits and retrograde orbits. And you can say, oh, some of this angular momentum transfer is due to a reversal. Some of it's due to that perpendicular wake. And that's really cool. So. When I started this experiment, I was like retrograde halos will not support bars because they will limit angular momentum transfer. The opposite is true. The bar loves a retrograde halo. It's just gonna shove angular momentum into it. Um, but we can't see dark matter halos, we can see disks. So what are the disks doing? Well, we know they have strong bars. Um, when we look at the angular momentum transfer, we've seen our non or the disk in our non-rotating halo before. It's moving angular momentum. It's got big spiral arms. It's lovely. As you increase retrograde spin, you're shortening the bar. You don't see any angular momentum transfer out here. This bar loves the retrograde halo so much, it's just shoving angular momentum into it and neglecting its disks. 
this has huge effects on morphology. So here are our surface density contours, or our disks. Um, around five gig years, in the middle of the simulation, you can see as you increase retrograde spin, you are shrinking your disk, and you are also making your spiral arms a little bit weaker. Um, so even though all of these guys are strongly barred, they have very different morphologies. Um, it would be really interesting <laughs> to see a bar in the wild with really limited spiral arms like this. But also I think it's interesting, if you increase angular momentum in either direction, you're shortening the disk. Uh, if you write a paper and you do isolated galaxy simulations, often the reviewer is an observer and she will say to you, this disk is way longer than we expect. This bar is way longer than we expect. And it turns out you can solve that problem by adding like a little bit of realistic angular momentum to your halo, which I think is just kind of cool. Um, but from these simulations, we are seeing all kinds of unique morphologies appear, which can tell us about the underlying dark matter and extragalactic systems. One of the interesting ones that I recently published with my undergrad, Emma, who will be applying to a grad school near you, is that in retrograde halos, you can get leading spiral arms. So if you saw this image and it did not say leading arms on it, you would assume that this disc is going in the clockwise direction. The bar is rotating, um, just like in a water, you would expect it to be dragging the wave behind it and creating a trailing spiral arm. But this bar is going counterclockwise. The spiral arm is ahead of the bar. If you know galactic dynamics, it's because the bar is really slow. Co-rotation is way out here. So inside co-rotation, you have leading spiral arms, but the bar is really slow. The stars are not gaining angular momentum. They're not losing angular momentum because the, ha the halo is absorbing it all. So these stars are moving fast. So they have to populate the leading spiral. Leading the spirals are observed, but their origin stories and papers often require really crazy um, merger scenarios to create them. And I just think it's really nice that we can have this simple two component experiment and get these long lived leading spirals. And the only thing we're doing is changing the dark matter. So when we see leading spirals, I'm gonna start thinking dark matter. I'm not gonna think like, oh, three exotic mergers happened in a row to get these crazy leading spirals. And I hope this movie will work. Okay, so you see the bar going counterclockwise. It has trailing spirals that will quickly flip as the bar slows down to leading spirals, which I hope you can see now. And they're really long lived. They last four or five giga years. And again, this is just a two component simulation. It's a nice bar. This is an exotic morphology we've observed. And now I wanna start talking about dark matter um, when we see them. But something else happened when I was watching this movie with my postdoc advisor, Anne Marie Madigan, because we stopped it about here. And she said, well, what happens if you continue the simulation? Because the bar is really slow. And while it's really slow, you can try to predict what's going to happen. <laughs> but we thought it would stop. And what happens if you observe a bar that's not moving? What is that like? But then something else happened. It reverses. <laughs> It's a kinematically decoupled disc now. You have a bar that's going clockwise. The leading arm or the spiral arms are going counterclockwise. The core of this barred galaxy is disparate from the outer galaxy. And we were like, oh, that's an interesting numerical experiment. We should write that up. But that galaxy exists. <laughs> um, so this is an older paper from. I think the mid nineties of an observation of a galaxy that you can even see here, this bar has um, spirals pulling this way and then the outer spiral is pulling this way. So the bar is going in the opposite direction of the outer spirals. Again, the formation scenario suggested in this paper was like 17 different mergers that pulled everything around. But I'd say, well, maybe it's in a retrograde halo. I mean, Retrograde halos might be rare because you would expect maybe the angular momentum vectors of disks and halos to be aligned, but space is big and we found one. Um, so that's really exciting. Okay, um, I will now talk about dark matter. So every single galaxy with a bar lives in a halo. 
it should have a dark matter bar that is aligned with the stellar bar and a wake of retrograde dark matter particles because we wouldn't expect a halo to be completely retrograde or prograde. So both of these features should exist. This substructure is uniquely formed by the stellar bar and it means our inner halos are not isotropic. Um, here's an experiment where I did completely retrograde or prograde halos. Uh, the stellar bar is approximated by this black line. You can see in a retrograde halo, you get this super nice wake. In the prograde halo, you get this really strong dark matter bar. This is the plane. You can see over densities, under densities, under densities here, over densities of dark matter. Because we live in a barred galaxy, we should not expect our dark matter halo to be a smooth distribution at the galactic center. And the great thing about the stellar bar driven dark matter substructure is that as the bar evolves, as the bar grows and gets longer, new dark matter orbits like can be trapped. So the distribution of this dark matter over density is going to match what we can see, which is the stellar bar. Um, <clears throat> another cool thing we found is that if you measure the ratio of the densities of these two components, you get this linear relationship with the spin of the halo. So here we measure the density of the galactic center and then the radius of the bar, um, parallel the bar and perpendicular the bar. So obviously the place to dark matter is most dense is the galactic center. But if we look where the bar is, you can see as you increase halo spin in the prograde direction, the importance of your perpendicular wake decreases and the importance of your parallel component increases. So in the event that we ever measure <laughs> dark matter density, we can make a statement about what our lambda is. Or more interestingly, if someone measures the halo spin, the cosmological spin parameter of the Milky Way, we could start making a statement of what we expect our perpendicular and parallel components to look like. Because knowing the spin and its direction, which we could learn from something like Gaia data, we can start learning about what the structure of our dark matter halo should be. Um, another interesting thing, so here we have two disks. Uh, these both look like disks we could observe, strong bars, spiral arms, but the dark matter substructure is totally different because we have a primarily prograde or primarily retrograde halo. If I measure the density along an annulus aligned with the bar in a prograde halo, you see overdense regions where the bar is and underdense regions where the bar is not. In a retrograde halo, you see the opposite. And you can see the effect is reduced because the um, perpendicular wake is not like a bar. It's not self-gravitating. So it's going to be a little bit weaker. But in a non-rotating halo where the population of prograde and retrograde orbits is the same, you still see a middle between these two. You still see both of these features. So every single halo, no matter what its rotation is, will host both of these. And that's really exciting. And for comparison, here's, there's an onboard system. Okay, huh, that's a lot. I will conclude. <laughs> um, we saw that the initial conditions of a dark matter halo can affect the evolution of a galaxy as a whole. We answered why some galaxies can avoid bar formation. They don't, they just form a bar and it dissolves. But we also saw it affects bar length, bar strength, radius of the disk galaxy, the density of the spiral arms, overall disk morphology. All of that is really exciting because we can see stars and we cannot see dark matter. So if we could uniquely pin some morphological features to underlying dark matter dynamics, we can learn about extragalactic dark matter halos. Um, what about in our own system? Where can we look for dark matter? So we find that dark matter wakes are offset from baryons. What does that mean? Here's an example of a beautiful barred galaxy. It lives in a halo. It has some population of retrograde dark matter. So it should have a perpendicular wake. Um, it's easier to see here, but stellar bars sweep up the material in the radius because most of the disk is prograde. Everything falls into the bar. It's a huge gravitational well that gets trapped. So we have an underdense region of baryons where we have an overdense region of dark matter. Of course, the dark matter here is less dense than at the galactic center, but the galactic center is dense with everything. 
Um, you have a lot of crap there. So if you are looking for an excess signal, you have to parse through so many signals. But here you have a lower density of baryons. It might be easier to see the signal. Um, here's just kind of a map of the kind of approximation I'm trying to do right now. Just like how, what exactly would the signal look like from the sun? Would it be large enough to see some sort of annihilation or decay signal from the overdensity of dark matter compared to the galactic center? Or is it still just too small to parse out? Another thing is that these dark matter substructures, they have height. They have scale height that the disk does not have. So if we point at the dark wake and then up above the plane of the disk, we should still have a little bit of overdensity there. What is that value? That's what we're doing now. Um, finally, how can you know a detection is dark matter? If you point your telescope at the galactic center, something like Fermi expects a isotropic spherical distribution, but we live in a barred galaxy. If I make a um, observation in an unbarred system, I get the same result. But if we have a very strongly barred system, which we do, we should expect the signal um, looking at like out to the bar length from our central galaxy to be bar shaped. It should be an oblate spheroid. So if you see an excess of gamma rays that's completely spherical and isotropic, I might doubt you that that's dark matter because it should be a little flat because it's a bar. Um, also, when we look at the sun, we don't look face on to the bar, it's at an angle. So the signals shouldn't be symmetric left to right, it should be stronger on one side because we're seeing more of the dark bar on one side. Um, so how do we know if a detection is dark matter? I would say, well, it has to be a bar. So if it's not a bar shape, it's not dark matter. Um, also, finally, <laughs> our, our current idea of dark matter is that before baryons can cool off and start forming galaxies, you have these little seeds of dark matter halos piling up. You get this nice hierarchical buildup of dark matter halos. They're smooth on first order, they're circular, spherical, <laughs> they're non-rotating, they're uninteresting dynamically. And then baryons fall into these preformed halos and that's the end of the story, but it's, it's not, right? The inner dark matter halo will evolve. If you have an active galaxy, if you have the most important feature, in the universe, a stellar bar, <laughs> it is going to move the dark matter around. That dark matter is going to play a role in how that galaxy evolves. Um, so this is a nice story for the start of a galaxy, but not how that galaxy will evolve in time. I think we're done. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Angela, for a fascinating talk. Um, I really enjoyed it. And I can see a lot of people are doing the clap emoji. So um, I think everyone really enjoyed your talk. Um, now, yeah, we have some time for questions in case people have any questions that they want to ask. Um, I guess, oh, okay, we already have some questions. Um, so let's see, I think Adrian was first. Hi, um, th thanks very much for the talk. It was very interesting. Um, could you go back to the first time you showed the, the kind of the stellar bar strength as a function of time, you know, for the different uh, spinning halos yes. or some version of that? Uh, oh, this is a long talk. Um, this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, you might have covered it and I just missed it. So maybe this is remedial, but. Um, one thing that caught my eye was um, that these small time scale oscillations, and there seems to be a trend mm -hmm. with the blue one like being the most rapid. Um, and, and so I was just wondering if that's like what's, what's going on with that. Um, this is also really, really small changes in resonant interactions. So as the bar is rotating, um, there can be patches in the disk where it will like hit and like there will be a bigger exchange of angular momentum or not. Um, this is actually a smooth version of all of these figures. They're a lot more oscillatory than you would expect. Um, and it's because this measurement is an approximation over the entire disk. And we're trying to study like just the bar strength. And so anything that's going on in the disk is gonna like add a little oscillation. But here, <laughs> these are very regular. 
And that is because of a resonant interaction unique to that disk. Thank you. I think Jordan is next. Cool. Uh, thanks, great talk, Angela. Um, I have two maybe related questions that are kind of building on your last point about the kind of cosmological assembly of halos. Mm -hmm. so, so the first one is maybe, maybe easy. Um, it's basically like, do if you take a cosmological simulation, are, is, are the properties of halos with high and low lambda, is there like a strong environmental dependence there? Or is this just kind of like randomly initialized at birth in some non-trivial way to um, understand? Yes. So the way angular or the way halos get angular momentum is through tidal torques. So if you are in a um, populated environment, you're going to have more galaxies pulling on you and giving that halo more angular momentum. So in a local region of space, like you would expect the galaxies to have a similar value of angular momentum, but it doesn't necessarily have to be aligned in the same direction. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And then, so kind of a follow on to that is we haven't talked about gas at all in this talk. And so I was wondering or it's if not. <laughs> you could, if you could speculate about, you know, our, our bars, especially in the early universe, um, you know, places where star formation would be promoted, or is this going to have a negative impact on star formation? Um, um, so I have a grad student right now who is running these simulations, but with a uh, additional gas component. But some interesting things. Um, so when you have a bar and you have a gaseous disk, the bar is gonna work to move gas around and form star formation. So the longer you have your bar, the more efficient, ooh, is that the right word? The more star formation you should have for longer. Um, in a simulation where the bar gets destroyed, the gas will kind of just funnel into the center and you will have a hot disk with like a gaseous core. What's interesting to me is um, how we can see this dark matter substructure. So if all the end body particles like stars are trapped in the bar, but you have a gaseous disk and you have gas moving around like your dark matter wake, it's gonna interact with that wake and hopefully highlight it. <laughs> in such a way that we can see it and make some statements about it. Um, so that's kind of what I'm interested in with gas. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I was just kind of okay. looking for wild speculation in any direction. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I think Matt was next. Um, hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, so I was just wondering about um, the size of the bar and how that relates exactly to the size of both the um, the size of the you know predicted gamma ray signal um, and stuff like Fermi, and then as well kind of the size of these wakes. Whether or not you can say anything about the size of the uh, uh, of the wake uh, from from you know the the observed size of the bar. Sure. Um, so. I am not an observer, but my interpretation of Fermi, and someone please correct me if I'm wrong, is that it is focused on the galactic center. So it's not necessarily looking to like as long as the bar's radius is, which is the extent of the dark matter substructure. But the stronger your stellar bar, and the more prograde your dark matter halo, the bigger your dark matter bar will be even at the galactic center. And remember it has that thickness too. So the stronger our bar is, the bigger, hmm, the more oblate I would expect the signal to be, the further it should go from spherical. Um, as for the extent of the dark matter substructure, as the bar grows, it's slowing down and it can resonate with new stars and it will trap new stars and get longer. As soon as it gets longer, it's like a new population of dark matter orbits that can now be trapped in the bar, just the way the stars are, which is why it's this very handy thing that the dark matter substructure is just gonna be completely aligned with the stellar bar. When you can see the end of your stellar bar, you know where your substructure will stop. Okay, thank you. Um, so I had a question, or actually I had a, a few questions if there's no more questions from other um, audience members. 
Um, so I guess one of my first questions is, so we mentioned this um, dark matter wake is not um, self-gravitating. So it's not really a bar. Um, you can't consider it like as a bound object. Um, plus like there's some overdensity there. So I'm wondering whether uh, the existence of that dark matter bar could have some sort of a back reaction on uh, halo stars and whether that might be something that you could look for using Gaia data, for example. Um, Cause I, I know you, you had focused a lot on the indirect detection side, but yeah. I was just curious if maybe there could be signatures on the dynamics uh, side. Yes, um, because it is just gravity, right? You have this overdensity of dark matter. If you have a star that's just like falling through that wake, we should be able to infer that something happened to it. So I, I do think this is something you could look for in Gaia data. Um, so we did publish this paper and we predicted where we expect our <laughs> perpendicular wake to be with respect to the earth. So maybe someone with Gaia data could do that for us at some point. Hmm. Um, I guess I had another question um, related to, yeah, like Fermi and other indirect detection probes of dark matter. Um, just because, you know, I don't work on this personally, but my understanding is that there have been like a number of claims regarding the morphology of like the inner galaxy GEV access. Like there have been some groups claiming, oh no, like the dark matter quote unquote signal looks more like this um, like bulgy box or bo boxy bulge disc, disc template or, or, or template. And so therefore we can attribute it to, to stars. And also there's like this north south huh. asymmetry. Um, but, and so then they're saying, okay, so it's not, therefore it's not dark matter. But it sounds like what you're saying is that that's actually evidence that it should be dark matter. Um, and I guess yeah. I'm kind I, of curious what your perspective is on like disentangling. Cause like the big controversy is like, is it dark matter? Is it pulsars? And like mm -hmm. people expect the pulsars to have a morphology that kind of mimics the, the stellar bar. So I'm, I'm kind of like curious what your thoughts are about like disentangling the two. Um. I haven't heard of people finding an excess boxy signal. That's very exciting. Um, but something I do know about is that that 10 GV excess, the galactic center, it's like isotropic, smooth spherical distribution of excess signal. And so I would say that that is evidence that it's not dark matter and there must be something else because we know that dark matter is gonna interact gravitationally. We know we have a huge stellar bar. Um, north south asymmetry, I think could also be a problem because we're not, ex not, uh, not a problem, but an example, because we're not exactly in the plane, right? We're a little above the plane. So we should see more of that dark matter bar than if we were in the mid plane because the dark matter is tall <laughs> compared to the disc. Um, so the, one of the goals that I have is to make a prediction, a morphological prediction of like, we know where the sun is. I know what the stellar bar looks like. Um, there are groups that are using Gaia data to calculate lambda, and I'm going to use that and be like, based on this lambda, this is the morphology of the signal I expect. Um, so that's a goal. Does that answer your question at all? I do yeah, think I really, that- <laughs> I really think you and Tracy Slatcher need to get into a room because she's like the one who discovered this like north-south asymmetry. Yeah, I think yeah. you guys need to like get into a room and, and, and talk about this. I think some really cool things could come out of this. Nice. I think that'd be really awesome. Um, okay, so that's enough cheerleading from me. Are there other uh, other questions from the audience? Or if not, um, maybe we can thank our speaker again um, for a really fabulous talk. And um, I guess coming up, you have a meeting with the grad students. Um, I think it's at 445. Um, okay. So yeah, thanks again.